You guys, she's just a pregnant lady. Why is everybody being so mean to her? She loves her dogs. I mean, anybody who walks their dogs and gives them treats is somebody you can trust. Good morning, how are you? Welcome to another episode of Revenge Review. We're going through Tom Bauer's Revenge, and we are more than halfway through. So the light is at the end of the tunnel. Thanks B. What are we going to do when we're done with this as far as royal news go? I thought about talking about Diana. I guess we could talk about Diana. But who I really want to talk about next is Wallace Simpson. And all of the abdication of the throne and all that. I would love to get into that and see where we can draw parallels between all the things we know about Harry and Meghan and what was going on with Wallace Simpson. And what happens when we have placed our eyes on something and created a fantasy that that is contrary to reality and then we base our life on that fantasy like that is the broader picture here on the harry and megan thing both of these people harry in his own way megan in her own way have created a fantasy and now they're trying to fit life into that fantasy regardless of whether it works or not and i think that um we saw that same thing with wallace simpson so anyway that's where i want to go next if you have any book recommendations on that subject, that would be awesome. Um, okay. In today's episode, last time we talked all about how Megan pulled out the most diabolical card of all time and said that if we can't get this media narrative under control, I'm going to kill myself. I rolled my eyes at that because that just doesn't seem like that's really a true statement. It seems to me like she's just saying that so that she can further manipulate Harry, further make him do what she wants. And everything's always got to be an emotional roller coaster in that relationship. They don't feel like the relationship is working if it's not like this. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's so many times people who feel like there's not a spark in our relationship if we're not fighting or making up. And I feel like in a lot of ways, Harry and Meghan function like that with everything. Everything's got to be a fight or we're making up. Not just between the two of them. Although I would guarantee you there's a lot of that going on in the relationship, but also just with the world. Like we have to create problems in the world and then we get to celebrate when we've solved those problems. We, oh, there's another one. And then like, let's have another celebratory victory when, you know, when we shoot that person down. That's why they're so legacious. Anyway, this episode is called Exposure. And this is where Megan goes to all of her friends and her name's not enough in the papers, I guess. And so she feels like it's her time to change the narrative. Her name's in the papers, all right, but not in the way she wants it to be. So she's decided that she's really got to cultivate a new narrative. She's got some real bad advice coming from some real questionable people who don't understand her new position in the world and in global politics and, and being part of the royal family. So she's got people in her ear telling her what to do next and informing what she needs to do in order to get her way. And she is going to get a bunch of her friends to go talk to People Magazine. And that whole letter with her dad that was supposedly, you know, the greatest fear of her life was that it would get leaked. You know, she was writing it with the knowledge that it probably would be because her dad's like such a horrible old man that he probably would. But, you know, she didn't want it to be leaked. That was the narrative that she told Jason Kanoff. But now she's got a bunch of her buddies and she's told them all that's in the letter. And then she's like giving them their marching orders, you know, go and see who you can talk to and get this information out there. I want the whole world to know that I'm a really great person. And one of the things I want us to keep in mind as we read this chapter is listen to how she has her friends describe her. Listen to what she thinks is, the, is a virtuous and, and well-lived life. It's very, 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 very different from how she's living her life behind closed doors. And the question that kept coming to my mind as I was reading this was, if you can identify what is a virtuous and well-lived life, why are you not pursuing that? Why is that not of worth or value to you? Why is the narrative that you've put out there one thing? It's very different from who she is as, as a person in the real world. Why is it that you can identify that clearly but then you make no effort to actually be that thing. What is the value and virtue of being able to say, this is who I am? Why, why do you care if people think that's who you are? If you 
if that's not the life you actually want to live. It, it seems really odd to me that she would even need people to believe she's a good person if she doesn't make any attempt in real life to be that thing. Why would you even care then? Why would you even care if people think that you're a good person? If she, she just seems completely divorced from morality on any level, except except for, I think the masses, I've, I've heard that the, like, like a lot of people like it if you're nice. So let's say that that's what I am. But I, I truly don't understand why she needs people to think that about her. She could very easily be a nice person if she wanted to be. She could be kind. She could be considerate. She could be giving. She clearly knows that that's what people want. That's why she's got to change the narrative. But when it comes right down to it, that's too much work. That's too much effort. That's not fun. I don't want to do that. Choose, choose one way or the other. You know, at least we could respect your choice to just wild out and be you, I guess. Just either, like, be the diva, but don't pretend you aren't. You know, if you want to be a diva, be a diva, you know. And we saw that, you know, on her podcast, Archetypes, or whatever she calls that silly thing. And she had Mariah Carey on there, and Mariah Carey called her out for being a diva, and she was super offended about it, and it was this real kind of awkward moment. Um, and she's like, that's not me. I've never identified with the diva. <laughs> what are you talking about? And it's like, but you are, you know? And I just find it exhausting that she continues to deny the reality. Embrace the reality. Why are you trying to put forth a false picture? What, what worth is there for you in the false picture? If none of your life is lived in the pursuit of that virtue that you want to describe, then why do you even call it a virtue? I, I cannot fathom the way that she carries out her life. I don't understand it. But anyway, so th this whole uh, chapter is about that that article that, that went out in People Magazine. So it starts out with, Megan confided her misery to her girlfriends in America. During their conversations, Megan disclosed that her father had ignored her, her plea to cease his attacks. Her letter, she said, had reminded him of the extraordinary kindness she had shown him before and after the wedding. What? 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 What is she talking about how I've been extraordinarily kind before and after the wedding? She hasn't talked to her dad in months. But she wants her girlfriends to believe that here she was, this poor pitiful little thing, just crying out in the darkness for daddy. But he had turned his back on her. She said that she had always cared for her father. She had a, a long history of looking after her father's welfare and trying to find solutions to his health problems. Always? You'd always been looking for solutions for his health problems? Then why is it that when he came to you saying, I'm having a heart attack and I can't come to the wedding, you were like, it really sucks that you're just deciding not to come. Sounds like a made-up story to me, Dad. You know, it's like... What is this foolishness about how she's always tried to help him find solutions to his health problems? She doesn't believe and believe in his health problems. Um, and, you know, in her phone calls to her friends, she lambasted her father's refusal to come to the wedding. Above all, she felt abandoned by the very palace officials assigned to protect her. To anybody who has a listening ear, Megan's got something to say. And don't you know that if Megan was a normal person, following her on Facebook would be your most favorite thing to do. Because she's the sort of person with the status updates that would have you rolling. She'd be over there posting all these sad sack quotes and like talking about how she was going to be a phoenix rising from the ashes and these, these shadowy and veiled references to all the people in her life who have abandoned her, but you know exactly who she's talking about. This is some kind of BS that she's been telling her friends. And it would just be... It's just amazing to me that she had five people in her life who, who were still sticking around to hear the same sorry, pathetic stories and the same rehashing of reality and the same changing of the narrative. You know, talking to her would be exhausting because she'd keep changing the story or adding in little details as they came to her. But somehow she corralled five friends 
uh, who know intimately all the details and all the drama of her and her dad. At the same time as she's over there whining and complaining to her friends, she's got two publicists who she's pumping for information about how to change the public narrative. One of the people that she met was a girl named Isabel May, who, who do you think she met Isabel May through? I'll give you one guess. Which guy is always lurking in the shadows? That's right. One Marcus Anderson had introduced her to Isabel May. Isabel May was a publicist in London. She claims she never gave Megan any professional advice about Thomas Markle or how to deal with the negativity surrounding her public image. Never fear, there's always Kaylee Thomas Morgan over there, only too willing to get in on how to tell the Duchess what to do next. She told Megan that all Megan needed was a high quality, high powered publicist who could completely and totally change the dynamic of her experience and the public narrative. And what Megan needed to do was just refuse to be silent. Who's that stuffy palace to tell you what to do? All you need to do is have a couple of well-placed stories in the paper, and all of this would be just yesterday's news. You know, we could help you with this, Megan. We'll tell you which way to go. Let us be your guide. Let our conscience be your guide. So Megan decides that, too true, she's been silent too long. It's time for her to fight back. At the same time, while she's listening to the fundamentally flawed information being handed down to her from Kaylee Thomas Morgan, who couldn't possibly know what she's talking about. Megan, Megan's friends are devastated to find out that Omid Scobie's book is still going to be published, but there's been a delay. Well, what are they going to do for their dear friend, Megan? You know, this, this girl that they describe as a diamond, they describe Megan as a diamond. What are they going to do for Diamond Megan? Here she is, this poor, put-upon young girl, lost in the wilderness of the palace, the howling wolves snapping at her heels every moment. How are they going to jerk their friend up out of this mire, out of this horrific, unimaginable North Korea of an environment? What are they going to do? The book, the book that they'd all helped work on, it's not going to press when they thought it was. Plan B then, everybody. Plan B. Gather round, girls. Let's talk about how we're going to save Megan. One of them had a friend, a personal friend, named Dan Wakeford. And Dan Wakeford is the editor of People Magazine. So they hustled on over to Dan and said, Dan, we think you should do a piece on Megan. There's just been so much negativity. They don't like her over there in England. But we need to uphold our American sister. And we need to let the world know that she's a great person. A diamond. A diamond is the best way to describe her. And so five of the friends, one of them being Lindsay Roth, her old friend from Northwestern, came out and were the principal sources for this story. Well, Megan would later insist, to no one's belief, that she had absolutely no idea that this story was going on. I, I have been blessed so incredibly with friends who, unbeknownst to me, gathered together like a force of womanhood, strength. They went out like roaring lions to tell the truth. Finally, people were taking up for me. They saw how maligned and abused I was being, how I had all but been gagged and shackled. And they rose to my defense, a collective force for eternal good. And they went to People Magazine and they told my tale of woe. I had no idea. I had no idea. But those are my friends. Those are the people I've chosen to surround myself with. People who would fight for me. Fight for me. Because I have been clipped. My wings have been clipped. My voice has been silent. I am all but destitute of spirit, body, soul, and mind. My friends came to me in my hour of need. Um, zero people believe that. And despite the fact that Megan's lawyers kept coming out pleading that she didn't know that her friends were going to give an interview to People Magazine. Nobody felt like it was possible for five of her friends to have this collective project going on and not one of them would tell Megan. What are they just like so over, like the generosity of their souls are, are, are so profound that here they would as a post Christmas gift to Megan come together to tell her tale and then 
send her a magazine with the cover picture on it and be like, surprise, Megan, we helped you. Why in the world would they do this when they have heard nothing from her for months except for the fact that her dad, scoundrel of them all, the, the lead scoundrel of all the scoundrels, has gone out to the media to talk when she didn't give him permission to do so? Why then would her friends, after hearing all that, think that they should go out to the media and talk? I, I just find that wild that they that any of us are supposed to believe that her friends would be comfortable speaking to the media without Megan's permission to do so. Even if they were like, it's going to be really positive. Well, Megan's going to want to control that. She wants to control everything. Her friends know how controlling she is. So they would not get together for this grand surprise, please. Um, one of the key ingredients that made this story so tantalizing for everyone was the fact that the friends claimed to know what was in that letter that Megan had sent her father. Now, up until this point, people didn't even know a letter had been sent to her father, but the friends exposed it. They said they knew it was in it. And though they did not produce a copy of the letter, they quoted from it as though they had all seen it. But of course, Megan can't, she can't come out and say she knew her friends were going to do this. How many times has Jason said, never explain, never complain. I won't go out, I won't go out, I won't go out. Even though he's helping them behind the scenes sort of underhandedly work with Omid Scobie, that was the extent of what Jason was going to do. And he was far overstepping his bounds to have done that. So in his mind, he's done all he can do to help Megan. And all in good time, if we'll just quietly sit back, you'll get your story out there. But that wasn't fast enough for Megan. So she's doing her own deals, but she knows she's got to deny it. Because she can't face the wrath of the palace. She's doing everything out of step with them as it is. So for her to go and be like, fine, I'll wrestle power, you know, and I'll get my own media team on this and I'll get my own publicist on this and I'll create my own story. I mean, if she thought she was on the outs before with the palace, this is going to put her squarely outside the doors. But knowing that this was coming out emboldened Megan. Now she was feeling like her old self again. The old self, the old Tig girl, you know, the one with all her self-help mantras and shallow celebrity shininess. Megan goes out on one of her charity events to 125, which is a charity for marginalized women in Bristol. And knowing that this article is going to come out that's going to paint her as this great person, she decides that she's going to prove it She's going to prove what a great person she is so that when that article comes out, everyone's going to be like, oh, you know what? Megan is, is a great person because listen to what she did at this charity event. So on the eve of the, of the article, she decides to precede it with the exposure of her beautiful soul. She marches over to a table that has bananas on it, takes out her felt tip pen and starts writing these things on them. You are strong. You are loved. You are special. And Megan thought that this was going to be the greatest boon that had ever come to any of these poor women when they open up their sack lunch and find a banana in it that says, you are loved. But when she's sitting on the corner of a curb with nothing to her name except for the sack lunch that's in her lap, I'm pretty sure she's not going to feel super loved just because the banana said so. And as you can imagine, the media ridiculed her. It's just so pathetic, so lame. It's so meaningless. It's such a shallow gesture of insincerity. Megan was infuriated. How dare people act like this doesn't expose her beautiful soul? She is a beautiful person with a beautiful soul. And can't you tell? The banana said so. The banana said, you're loved, you're special, you're beautiful. How else can, can how can anybody deny how good she is? After seeing her do something like that. She's the nicest person you ever met. Do you carry around a felt-tip pen ready to write on any banana you see? Probably not. Because your soul just isn't as beautiful. Megan was not going to let that stop her. If she couldn't get out her message on bananas, then she was going to make sure that people heard her loudly give feminist sentiment uh, wherever she went. She went to Manchester University. And many of the staff, she was told by the activist Rachel Cowan, were, now sit down, I don't know if you can handle what they were, many of the staff were white and 
men. Megan was shocked. And she said, well, this is shocking. And clearly, we have some way to go. White men? On staff? At a university? Are we in the dark ages? How do we claw our way out of this? Once again, observers were puzzled. After almost three years as part of the royal family, Megan's still over there busting up with the cardinal rule that says, let's not be, imp- let, let, let's not be so partial, right? The golden rule is impartiality at all times. Never showing your cards. Never getting political, right? Because that's not your job. That's not your job. You're supposed to be representative of everybody in England. So you can't take these little moments to show how enlightened you are about the ways of the world. Quite frankly, isn't your husband a white man? So do you feel like you should have done better? Isn't this a slight against you that you would choose a wealthy white man as a husband if they're the scourge of the earth? Okay. Megan had only had 11 appearances in the first seven weeks of the year versus Princess Anne's 25 full, full days, full days of the new year. So not just 25 appearances, 25 full days of work. Megan's had 11 appearances, one of which included writing on bananas and the other one included spitting in the faces of white men. How Megan thought she was going to be able to fly under the radar with this kind of work ethic, I can only imagine. And again, she wants everyone to think that she's just pounding the pavement, hit the ground running. You've never seen someone work so hard. She's a whirlwind of activity. Doing what though? A whirlwind of activity. I really, 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 really want to know what she's doing with all her time. Because in seven weeks, you can only go do 11 royal appearances. What in the world does she spend her time doing? Well, once again, Bauer poses this question. He does it over and over and over again. Now, we know he's a lawyer. And this book is clearly the legal briefing of as if he were going to take this to court. Because he keeps reminding the jury. What's the question here? Did she really want to be part of the royal family? Or did she just care about celebrity? You know, how many times is he going to ask us that question? But he's trying to prove his point here. And again, he poses that question. Did Meghan intend to play her part as a young royal fulfilling her duties or was public recognition and celebrity more important? Well, the question was answered on February 6, 2019 by the publication of People magazine. Under the cover's headline, Her Best Friends Break Their Silence, the subheading was The Truth About Meghan. And more telling was the headline, Meghan's Media Fight Back. Megan, the magazine implied, had authorized her friends to brief the magazine. What I think is really interesting is, did Megan ever sue People magazine? Did she ever come out and say, people are citing a letter that they never had any business knowing anything about? No, she never sued them saying that people had taken her letter to her father and used it out of context or used it nefariously without her permission none of that so i mean she absolutely authorized her friends to speak no one ever said megan called the magazine up but her friends certainly knew exactly what she wanted them to say all five of them the article's substance was a flattering profile of a loving daughter living a frugal life in Kensington Palace who despite being publicly maligned by a dreadful father had sought heartfelt reconciliation The breakdown in their relationship, Meghan's friends claimed, was entirely Thomas Markle's fault. The published article gave the impression that Meghan had informed at least one friend about the contents of her letter to Thomas Markle and his reply to her. Summarizing excerpts of Meghan's letter to Thomas, People magazine described the letter as a loving offer of reconciliation written days after the wedding. But in fact, Meghan wrote it three months later. Contrary to what she would later claim, the magazine had put the contents of the letter into the public domain. No. Megan, you put the letters into the public domain when you told your friends, go call up People Magazine. One of you guys knows the editor over there. Make it happen, Captain. And I just feel like 
for her to later come out and say, I had nothing to do with this. I had no knowledge is the lamest lie of them all. I mean, she's told some whoppers already. Her ability to determine what the public will believe really exposes a r reduced mental capacity. Who in the world would buy this lie that she didn't know? I'm so sick and tired. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. I don't recall. Megan would emphatically deny being aware that the five had gotten interviews to the magazine or that the letters would be quoted. She would also claim to have become aware of the magazine's publication only after Harry told her. And then Harry only heard on the day of the publication from Kensington Palace's media team. Kensington Palace knows what's going on in the media world. They're always telling her before stories hit what's going down. So for her to say they only knew about it the day it hit the newsstand, BS. All right, so already that's a lie. But then for her to be like, I didn't have any idea about it. But then Harry came to me and told me that my friends had given an interview to People Magazine. I never saw that one coming. But it's really notable that she's not mad at any of her friends for doing it. She continues to deny she knew about it, but she's never like, I'm really upset at their betrayal. But when her dad took pictures to improve his appearance in the media, she saw that as a massive betrayal, even though it had nothing to do with her whatsoever. And now her friends get together and all of them collectively decide to go to a huge celebrity paper like People and give a detailed interview complete with quotes from a private letter to her father. But that's not a betrayal. I mean, that's all her reaction to what they did is proof enough that it wasn't a secret to her. If her friends had done that without her knowledge, even if it was positive, she still, she would have been upset, I think, because it wouldn't have been the words, the exact words she wanted them to say. They would never have gone against her like this. Because it's my belief that all her friends were only too willing to get in on this media circus because they're all social climbers just like she is. That's why they're so mad about Omen Scobie's book not coming out when they had expected it to because they were thrilled they'd gotten a piece of that pie. They were thrilled to have been interviewed for it. So they are not looking for their gratification to be delayed any further either. That's why they pounce on this opportunity. They're not going to alienate Megan by doing something she doesn't want them to do when they're so eager to be in her inner circle. Of course they had permission. The article was written by Michelle Talbert, and the article described how Megan had authorized five friends who, quote, knew Megan best to set the record straight. The five women, described as a longtime friend, a former co-star, a friend from Los Angeles, a one-time colleague, and a close confidant, painted an image of Megan's elegance, grace, and philanthropy. Rejecting the portrayal of Megan as a demanding bride, an exhausting boss, and an uncaring daughter, the magazine quoted one friend's eulogy. She is a diamond doing her duty. They all sound about it as terrible as she is. All of them. Listen to the way their friends talk. None of these people are registered with reality. So Megan's over there doing her duty, according to one friend. And this is how she claims Megan really need never apologize for her behavior again because she did this for the staff. Megan had purchased an incredible ice cream and sorbet stand for her Kensington Palace staff. And that, testified the friend, evoked heartful cheers for the best day of work ever. I'm pretty sure that after your boss has lambasted you, degraded you, torn your self-esteem to shreds, and then she hands you an ice cream cone, you wouldn't be like, let's forgive and forget. This is great. I was about to leave this place with my soul unintact, but now that I have a cup of sorbet, we're good to go. Somebody help Megan understand reality. And her friends are so lame for believing any of this. And then, first of all, it'd be lame enough if they believed it on their own. But for them to scurry on over to People Magazine and expose their colossal ignorance and expose how naive they are, this isn't a good look for any of them either. Portraying Megan as an unselfish woman living modestly, another friend described Megan as lonely, frustrated, and denied any staff in Nottingham Cottage. But why would she need staff? That cottage is a, it's, it's a small home. 
You know, it's perfect for two people. What do you need staff for? How messy are you that you need somebody to come and clean up after you? It's you and your husband. You guys can't pick up your things. You can't cook some supper for you guys. Like what staff are you talking about that you don't have? You've got plenty of staff to help you get your work done as far as like royal stuff. And you have seemingly a enormous amount of time since you only do like 11 engagements in seven weeks. Is that... Are are you so taxed for time that you can't pick up after yourself? You can't, you know, make a little stir fry? I mean, what's going on here? Despite the fact that she was lonely and oppressed, her friend said that Megan is the most down-to-earth wonderful person you've ever heard. And, and, and these are the traits and characteristics of one who is down-to-earth and lovelier than you could ever believe. She provided hand warmers for the police guarding the palace gates. That's Megan's favorite thing. To She must have a stockpile of these. She must have seen this somewhere where somebody handed somebody else a hand warmer and then she decided that she would always make sure she had some. So out of the largesse of her heart, she is out there handing out hand warmers for the police guarding the palace gates. Also, she likes to paint her nails while sitting next to a heater because the place is just doesn't have any warmth. But huddled up next to the heater, she's just like you or me painting her nails. She doesn't have any staff to paint her nails. There's nobody in there to help her with that, but she can do it herself next to that heater. She's she's found a way still to be happy. She's still, you know, cheerful and grinning with her fingernail polish and her little seat by the heater. And the friend also wants to let you know that she's happy to wrestle up a five-star meal out of the garbage in your refrigerator. That sentence doesn't really make sense because the pronoun tense is wrong, but I think what's trying, what's, what's supposed to be being said here is that Megan has the potential to be able to rustle up a five-star meal out of the garbage in one's refrigerator. Um, well, if she's happy to do that and she has the capacity to do it, then why is she crying that she has no staff to do it? Friends, are you listening to what Megan is saying to you? They go on. One friend describes her as very self-service, which doesn't even make grammatical sense, but she's very self-service. And they said that she has a close relationship with God and a deep sense of gratitude and humility. And anybody who wants to say that her up at 5 a.m. is browbeating to the staff, it isn't. It's just people are misreading her organized, diligent, focused, hardworking nature. So get that right, everybody. She's actually an awesome person who loves, who loves Jesus and has a real deep sense of gratitude and humility. But you guys... This is, goes back to what I was talking about earlier. Why does she feel the need to describe herself this way? It isn't important enough to her that she would live her life in this way. So what? why does she care what anybody thinks? Why does she have to put this narrative out there? If she cared enough, she would do these things. Fundamentally, I just don't understand why she needs this to, to be what's out there. No, no part of her cares about being this way. Similarly, the staff turnover, they said, was just all natural courses of employment, which makes you want to ask yourself, do any of these women work? Have they ever worked in an office? This is not normal or natural that people are leaving saying that they are a destroyed personality. And if you are working and this is your natural environment, I am so sorry. That is terrible that you think that this is a normal working environment where people are just falling out like flies. They also showed a little bit of disdain for Harry and they were insensitive to the implication of Harry's competence because they said that Meghan often had to help him write his speeches. First of all, if Meghan is the one you're turning to to help you write speeches, then we're all doomed. But they don't need to expose Harry like that. That is not something I'm sure he would want the world to know. And if the other, if the opposite was said of Megan, Harry has to help Megan write her speeches, she would be incensed with rage. But it's okay for the friends to say that about Harry. Because you can imagine that Megan is not very kind in her speech about Harry. Like when she's talking with her girlfriends, you know she's not uplifting her husband. Even though she always goes out to all the media and is always talking about, I just wanted to do whatever I could to protect H. It's like, do, uh, are, really? None of us believe that. Especially not after your, your weeping episode on the floor telling him you were going to kill yourself and your baby. I'm sure you really, really, really care about H's feelings. The friends also wanted everybody to know that the story about the tiara and the perfume in the chapel, 100% untrue. None of that happened. It's like just a bunch of 
gossipy courtiers with a, you know, a, a bunch of lies that you just don't like Americans is really it. And the other thing that's not true is Megan and Catherine don't have any problems with each other, okay? Meg and Kate are besties. And so that, that weird narrative needs to die already because it's so not true. The five friends' significant contribution was their description of Megan's relationship with her father. They claimed that it was false to suggest that Megan had shut Thomas out. On the contrary, her letter had sought to repair the relationship. And they were very insistent on this point. Megan loves her dad, wants to have a relationship with her dad, and that's what the letter said. But that old buffoon just completely and totally shut the door in her face, even though she was trying to get him to love her again. The blame for not speaking or texting since the wedding fell entirely on Thomas Markle. The magazine reported that Megan had written, Dad, I'm so heartbroken. I love you. I have one father. Please stop victimizing me through the media so that we can repair our relationship. But of course, we know that's not true. We know that she said explicitly to Jason Kanoff, I am writing this letter so that my dad knows the door is shut on our relationship. I don't want one with him anymore. And this is my final words to my dad. Okay, so we know that to be true. So we would know that the stuff that came out in the People magazine is a complete and total fabrication of what was actually said. I do not know how Megan thought that her dad, who is no stranger to the media, wasn't going to come quickly hustling out to set the record straight. And maybe that's what she was banking on, that he would come and set the record straight. But the letter that he has from her is not great. It's a, com it's a complete departure from what her friends are saying. So I'm not sure what Megan was hoping would happen there. But maybe it's just that he would come out, he would expose the letter, and then she could say once again, see, here he is, our private communication, and he's splashing it all over the page you know, all over the place. Can anybody blame me for not wanting to have a relationship with this man? And of course, we know that she'd carefully crafted that letter so that in the event that it was leaked or was given to the press, she would look like this heartbroken young lady. She does look heartbroken in the letter, I guess you could say, although uh, to any discerning eye, it's the most manipulative letter you ever saw. But she thought she'd carefully crafted it so it would look like she was really this poor little victim to her father's rage, indignation, and abuse. But even though in her mind it's it's not going to be a, a ne necessarily a negative if anybody reads the letter, it will be because it's a direct contradiction from what she told her friends to say. So everyone's going to see there's some lie has happened here. Regardless of the content of either of the letters, they don't match. So somebody's lying. But back to the People magazine article, her friend's purpose, they said, was to tackle the lies the emotional trauma, and expose the, expose the global bullying inflicted upon a pregnant person who loves her animals and loves her friends. You guys, she's just a pregnant lady. Why is everybody being so mean to her? She loves her dogs. I mean, anybody who walks their dogs and gives them treats is somebody you can trust. Focusing on Thomas Markle, one friend said he had ignored over 20 phone calls and texts before the wedding for Megan. He knows how to get in touch with her. Her telephone number hasn't changed. He's never called. He's never texted. I think she'll always feel genuinely de devastated by what he's done. Poor Megan. Can you imagine it? Her dad is so mean. They also claimed that Megan was hurt that Thomas had just refused to get in the car that she provided to take him to the airport and that he had not even told her that he wasn't coming to the wedding. That she woke up on the wedding day and didn't even know where her dad was. That's the kind of person Thomas is. She even brought a car around to the house to pick him up and he just didn't get in it. And she didn't even know he wasn't coming. And that, that big fat weirdo is out here saying Megan's so terrible? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. He, he's the bad one. Clearly, the friend relying on Megan did not believe that Thomas Markle had undergone heart surgery or even been ill in the hospital, which reflects the fact that neither did Megan. That was the story she was telling everybody. My dad says he's in the hospital, but we know he isn't really. Can you imagine if you were Thomas Markle cracking open this magazine and reading this story? This is not what this man needs to help him move on. It's super painful, the friend continued, because Megan is always so dutiful. At the same time, because she's a daughter, she's a lot of sympathy for him. 
She took care of her father with such incredible generosity. The fact that this could be flipped around and that she was acting out or not caring for him is preposterous. All right, well, I got a lot of problems with what this friend just said. If this friend is trying to make Megan look better, she really is failing at the job because this line right here, Megan was always so dutiful. Well, yeah, that makes it sound like she's doing something, dragging her feet. She has to do it. It's a duty. She doesn't love her dad, but she's throwing him a couple of bones over time because it's her duty after all. And even the friend goes on to say, at the same time, she's a daughter, so she has a lot of sympathy for him. So basically, let's translate what the friend is saying. Megan hates having to take care of her dad because he's just a fat phony. But since she is his daughter, she does kind of feel bad for him. And the friend wants us all to know that Megan is just so generous. Well, if she is, then she just shut her trap and keep trying to do for her dad without having the whole world know her business. But let's move on. Megan, the friend says, has looked after her father financially and, by the way, has been a rock to everyone in the family. So whatever Samantha's over here talking about or Tom Jr., total and utter trash. Megan has been the only one anyone could rely on in this chaotic family. Meg has silently sat back and endured the lies and untruths. We worry about what it's doing to her and the baby. Oh my goodness. Like, all these sycophant friends, I'm so agitated by all of them. And I'm so grossed out by how Megan gets people around her who just believe her lies and then are willing to regurgitate it. I mean, Harry, number one. Harry's been doing the work of the devil for a long time now. And all of these five friends are doing the exact same thing. It's just like, Megan's like, these are the lines, just say them. I'm going to program you to say these things, just say these things. And they do. Thomas Markle was accused by People Magazine of being an outright liar. The source of all that information could only have been Megan. Not least because she repeated the same version of the loving, caring daughter cruelly spurned by her wicked father to Jason Kanoff. But the magazine's publication sparked a frenzied farce. Buckingham Palace was profound profoundly shocked. How in the world could she have the audacity to go out and just create her own media sensation? She has people at her behest to help her manage this. Completely bypass them. You guys aren't working at the pace I need. On to People Magazine. Friends, you know what to do. You've been given the lines to say, Sam, Sam, Sam. Unbelievable. The magazine's contents were dynamite. No one could understand Meghan's plan. Since she was abrasive towards her father, palace officials asked how did she intend to treat the royal family? The blowback in the palace surprised Meghan. How could it? How could she be shocked? Well, Jason washed his hands of this entire thing. When she came begging to him saying, Jason, go out there and give a firm denial that I had anything to do with this. You know I wouldn't do something like that. Jason's like, I absolutely know you would do something like that. How have I not bent over backwards for you with Omid Scobie and Carolyn Durand? So enough with this foolishness that you want me to go out and deny it. I refuse to. You and I both know you did it. And I'm not going to come out and say something that didn't happen because they got burned the last time they did that. Remember when they said that, I'm trying to remember what happened. They defended her in reference to something with Thomas Markle. And then it came out that, oh, with the pictures. They, Megan said, my dad didn't know anything about this. Go out and say he didn't know anything about this. And then when it came out that Thomas did know something about it, the palace is embarrassed. So now it's like, okay, the rule is, if Megan says she didn't know something about it, don't even, just don't even touch it with a 10-foot pole. Don't say anything. Now she's even more angry. Kanoff, I told you. You know what to do. You go out and deny it. No, he won't. And so now she's upset again. Kanoff's office just kept saying no comment, no comment, no comment to hundreds of media inquiries. Megan would later protest about shared frustration regarding Kanoff's refusal to comment. That left everyone feeling silenced, she complained. Since neither Kensington Palace nor Buckingham Palace denied the article was sanctioned by Megan herself, most people assumed that the five people had quoted her actual letter and spoken with her approval. People Magazine never received a complaint about the breach of Megan's copyright of her letter, which is very telling. If Megan had really had nothing to do with it, she would have gone hustling over with about 16 lawyers to go and settle that mess. Meanwhile, we can only imagine Thomas Markle's reaction to this. The article is a total lie, he cursed. It misrepresented the tone and content of the letter that Meg had written. 
Her letter had accused him of manufacturing pain, being paranoid, being ridiculed, fabricating stories of attacking Harry and continually lying. He said that he quickly decided he wanted to correct the misrepresentation. Well, of course he did. Could we have expected anything less? He claimed that Meg's letter was not an attempt at reconciliation. The letter didn't say she loved me, said Thomas. It showed no concern that I had suffered a heart attack. It actually signaled the end of our relationship. I just wanted to defend myself. And he added, Megan's a liar and very controlling. So I guess she's finally done the thing that he said he could never understand why people called her Duchess difficult. You know, short of urinating on homeless people, and he literally said that, short of urinating on homeless people, I don't understand why anyone would think that she's so bad. Well, maybe he's starting to realize that she really is pretty terrible person and that it's not going to take her urinating on a homeless person for it to be exposed that she is the most selfish, self-gratifying individual yet to roam the earth. To fight his corner, Thomas Markle showed parts of the two letters to the Mail on Sunday. In publishing the extracts, the newspaper justified their breach of Meghan's copyright and privacy by claiming that Thomas Markle was entitled to contradict the magazine's distortions. There was, the newspaper believed, a huge legitimate public interest in the royal family and in Meghan. She enjoyed immense privilege and wealth funded in part from public money, and she expected her elaborate handwritten letter to be leaked and published. So, Thomas Markle's firing back. Unsurprisingly, we all knew that he would, and he's letting people see the real letter. And, of course, he is his own person. That letter now belongs to him. It was written to him. And if he wants to show it, he can. And... He has every right to defend himself with the contents of the letter in question. Megan, in reply, would claim the publication of her letter was part of the Mail's campaign to publish false and derogatory stories about her. In Los Angeles, Megan's advisors were convinced that the British media's criticism of Megan was racist, sexist, and snobbish. They encouraged their client to launch a legal action against the newspaper. How is it racist, sexist, or snobbish for a man to try to defend himself against being maligned in the press by his own daughter? If she didn't want any of this to happen, she would have done exactly what the palace said and lay low when it comes to your dad. Well, first of all, she would have gone to see her dad. She has created all of this drama for herself. Every single stitch of it she has created. And she could have avoided all of it. Nobody has any pity for her. Nobody can understand why in the world she keeps asking for us to be sorry for her when she's dug her own grave. Sunshine Sachs and her other publicists began searching for celebrities prepared to defend their client. Of course, Megan's newfound friendship with George Clooney, which has come in handy a couple of times already, uh, is going to be the one that she leans on during this situation. And you guys, what is the deal with George Clooney? You know, I've never been a real Clooney sycophant. Probably I never really got into him. He was kind of before my time on General Hospital and all this. Like, I wasn't really paying attention to George Clooney in his heyday. But regardless of that, I don't understand what this man's... What are, what are his priorities? I never thought one way or another about him. But then after the wedding and I found that he had used it as an opportunity to pro to promote his own brand, I liked him less. And then when I found out that he liked Meghan and Harry enough to invite them on his private plane on vacation with them in Italy, I liked him even less. And then when I found out that he was willing to host a dinner so that Meghan could cozy up to Michelle Obama, I liked him even less. And now I've really reached the bottom of the barrel on my feelings about George Clooney. This guy was pers was persuaded to enter the fray against the newspaper. Just as Meghan and Harry headed for an official visit to the National History Museum, Clooney comes out swinging with his own set of lies and his own set of defending statements. In a statement issued by his publicist, he attacked the media for reproducing People Magazine's article. You are taking a letter from a daughter to a father and broadcasting it everywhere. She's getting a raw deal there. It's irresponsible. Next... Of course, this is what he's going to do next, because like everyone else who seems to be entirely simplified in mind when it comes to the royal family, he pulls the Diana card. All hail St. Diana. He compared Meghan's fate with Diana's. Pursued, vilified, and chased like the princess, thundered Clooney. It's history repeating itself. 
We've seen how that ends. Dun, dun, dun. Well, we haven't, though, because Diana wasn't anything like Megan, and Megan is a poor, pathetic soul living her life based off the tragedy of somebody else and trying to cosplay it for her own advantage. So we really don't know how this ends. The American movie star roused the British tabloid's anger. No paparazzi were chasing Megan, and there had been no intrusion into her private life. Not even an unapproved snap of her while pregnant had been published. Clooney, they asserted, had invented his version of events. The Sun rolled out their veteran royal photographer, Arthur Edwards, a Diana expert. The biggest invasion of Meghan's privacy, he wrote, was triggered by herself and her own family. Clooney's hysterical mischaracterization missed the point. While Meghan had declared war on the media, she was simultaneously to People magazine arguing that she had the right to speak. Her father did not. Moreover, no one had forced Diana to sit without a seatbelt in a car recklessly driven by a drunk. Clooney was not thanked by many Britons for his intervention. Yet even the son was unsure about the public's mood. Many readers still adored Megan. To please them, the newspaper published Karen Brady's description of Megan as gorgeous and a positive person doing positive things. Who had been appallingly treated by her fame-seeking father. A positive person doing positive things? Even poor Karen Brady is running out of things that she can say. She can't even find a new adjective to use. With Clooney on her side, Meghan persuaded Harry that her methods were right. They should have been in the royal press officers and rely on her Los Angeles publicists. In future, Harry and Meghan would distribute their own unfiltered message through social media. Okay, so that's where we end there. I can only imagine how sad the Queen must have been for Harry to see him attached to this person. And we know now that the Queen's last years were riddled with the horrors of bone cancer and for harry to be so selfish so self-centered so unwilling to see how he could have made her last years better he just heaps stress on stress on stress and we know how little he cared for his grandfather's life when he did the interview on oprah and in that interview made no attempt to clarify the narrative about a senior royal saying racist things which as we've covered many times it was just hysterical that anybody called that racist did anybody even bought the fact that the phrase what will the baby look like is racist i can't even with with that anymore i'm so sick and tired of it but it makes me really sad to read these things and to read in detail what happens when a person is so driven by their insistence on a false reality. Meghan and Harry, both of them, have decided what reality is and they are forcing the puzzle pieces of life in to create a picture that those puzzle pieces were never meant to create. It's just eye-opening and sobering to think. Like, how can I apply what I've just read? Like, what, where in my life am I refusing to see reality and insisting on a narrative of my own choosing? I'm sure there's areas in my life where I do that. I'm sure that there are portions and places in my life where I know things could be changed and could be different by a shift in my response to them. I know where I could bring things better, but I want to be lazy and just keep doing the same other thing. It's like I keep saying about Megan, why does she know the right answers, but why won't she, why, why does she refuse to do them? But where in my life do I know the right answers and I'm refusing to do them? You know, maybe I'm not calling up a a magazine and saying, please write an article about what a great person I am. But where am I trying to project the fact that I've got it all together when I know that I don't? And I'm making no attempt to. I just want people to think I do. Like, do I do that? Maybe, you know. Anyway, the next chapter that we read later this week is called Baby Shower. And I believe, I haven't read this one yet, but I think this is probably about that baby shower that she went on. Ooh, I'm seeing Marcus Anderson's name come up. I mean, who's be surprised about that? Um, anyway, the next chapter we read is called Baby Shower. It's really, 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 really short though. So I might combine that with um, the next chapter called Wellness. 
Yes, I think I will. Next time we get together, we're going to be doing two chapters, baby shower and wellness. All right. I will see you guys later this week on those two chapters. And I hope that you have a great week. Also, don't forget this weekend, we're going to be doing two more chapters of our Hunter S. Thompson book. So if you're looking forward to a, a change in pace, looking forward to a different topic, I got you covered this weekend. See you later. Bye.